Hey guys, it's your girl Jazzy Mango and I'm here at the McKinnon Acting Studio. Listen, I'm about to meet Mr. Mark McKinnon himself. And I tell you, you don't want to miss this. He's got some amazing tips for you actors out there. Stay tuned. Hey guys, this is your girl Jazzy Mango and welcome to the Jazzy Mango Red Carpet Lounge. I have a special guest with me today, none other than... What's going on? I'm Mark McKinnon and I'm chatting it up with Jazzy Mango on the Red Carpet Lounge. Hey Mark, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm good. How about you? I'm super excited. Like, I know we've been trying to get this interview for a minute now, so I'm so <laughs> glad that we were able to. Absolutely. So I just wanted to ask you, I want to ask you a little bit background about yourself, starting from the age of six. Who did you want to be at six years old? Was this it? No, it wasn't. I didn't even know I wanted to be an actor at six. Um, honestly, I grew up wanting to be an architect. Like My okay. mom has a whole box full of drawings that I have, drawing floor plans. I didn't use no ruler or anything, so the lines were crooked, but I used to draw like houses, the first floor, second floor, wow. how I wanted the rooms to be, the steps. I would literally detail that. So when I was in high school, I was looking up uh, colleges that specialize in architecture that was good in that. So I thought that was the route I was going to go. But then when I found out how much math went into it, I said, yeah. You was good on that. <laughs> you know what? So I see that you are an alumni of HU. Absolutely. You know, definitely. Shout out to Howard right Real there. Real HU. <laughs> We're back in the day, right? <laughs> so what made you switch your major? Because I had a similar situation. I actually went to college to become a judge. Wow. And someone told me, listen, you like to gossip. I think you got juicy things going on. I think you need to go into broadcast media. And I was like, nah, it ain't making no money there. <laughs> right. yeah. So for me, it started actually in high school. It was a young lady I was dating at the time. You know, okay. in high school, you can sit in on the audition. So I was supporting her, went there to, uh, you know, watch her work. And the director saw me in the room and she said, Mark, we want you to audition. Because I took like a drama cl uh, elective. Okay. Day. She's like, Mark, you should audition. We need you. I was like, you need me? You don't know if I'm good or not, you know? Uh, but she was like, you know, we need you. And so I decided to go ahead and audition. And then I ended up booking the leading role. Mm -hmm. And so when I booked the leading role, what made me realize it was something big about this was there wasn't that many African-Americans that were in the plays back then, especially males, especially athletes. Yes. You know, so I got into the play. Of course, a lot of my teammates from football and basketball came. They laughed at me. You know, to tease me a little bit, but that following year, so many blacks came out mm -hmm. to audition for the play and be a part of the play. When I saw that social change, I said, wow, like the craft of acting, my passion, though I started to develop the passion at the time, made me wanted to like go further with it. And that's when I said, you know what, I'm going to find a school that can, you know, that has a great theater arts program. Because at the time I was focused on theater. I didn't know I wanted to really do film and TV. And that was a challenge, too, because I was an athlete. I had a lot of football scholarship offers, right. and a lot of those schools didn't have the theater arts program that I wanted to. A lot of them had classical training programs. I knew I didn't want to go that route. Absolutely. You know, and that's how I ended up at Howard, because they have a phenomenal theater program where, yes, they have classical and contemporary work and training to get you going where you want to go. So I want to ask you, you mentioned a few things. Mm -hmm. You as being an African-American male, mm -hmm. how did that make you feel when so much of your peers came out to support you? I know it's very mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. as an African-American male, period. I mean, it was a phenomenal feeling. It was life-changing, like literally, because it was at that moment when they came out that I realized it was a different direction I wanted to go with my life and in my career. Um, so to see that, to see the impact, because I believe like purpose is all about how you're impacting somebody else. Absolutely. It was at that moment I realized there was a greater purpose to me when it came to acting and how I can use that to support my passion. So we see you now and we can um, follow your journey. But when you were going through college and you were experiencing different things, you were getting a lot of no's from your auditions or maybe not even having the opportunity to get auditions. How did you stay focused and determined to keep going? 
Man, you, you bring me back. I mean, it was it was it was hard. I know oodles tough. and noodle days. Oodles and noodle days. <laughs> I remember when I was going back and forth to New York. Like I used to ask to ask my mom, "Can I get like twenty dollars to get on the boat bus? Can you come pick me up as well on the other mm-hmm. end?" Like I remember those days. But what kept me going, honestly, was still being involved with so many different things you know, of skills that I had. You know, I did a little bit of photography. I did a little bit of directing of shows. I was very involved in my church. You know. So those things kept me sane because there was a season in my life where I was only focused on acting. And when you do that, acting because you don't have full control of the decision makers and them choosing you, you can be on an emotional roller coaster just waiting for that next job, you know. So being busy and, and, and also starting a studio, like that was something that kept me going because now my energy was spread apart. And that's when I realized acting is just like a puzzle piece of all of me. It wasn't all of me. Absolutely. You know, and when I had made that decision, I recognized that and had that revelation, things change. So even when acting has a slow season, I'm good. Do I still have some little, you know, pain in the corner? Yeah, I had those moments, but it's nowhere near as bad as it used to be. It's not like I can't function. It's just one of those, all right, what can I be doing in the meantime until that next job comes? And I commend you because what you actually did was you realized that this whole industry is a business. It is. And so when one thing is going down, you still keep another afloat with other things that you had. Absolutely. And like you said, you are, were an architect. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You were interested in that. Mm-hmm. It's so many avenues people don't realize mm-hmm. that you might think, oh, I needed math for this. But it can plug into acting Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so you said you got your studio. Mm-hmm. When you got your studio, what made you start transitioning to now teaching people how they can do what you do? So here's the crazy part. I was already helping actors and coaching them when I didn't realize I was. You know, mm-hmm. when I was directing this play at the time, it was a, a pretty big cast. At the same time, I'm going back and forth to New York to build my career. So they were asking me, hey, how do I do this? How do I get on that commercial like you did? How do I get an agent? I'm just like, oh, try this. Do this. Yeah. And they applied it, and sure enough, it was working. So it was around like 2012 when my mentor said, you know what, you know you have a business there. I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, don't you feel like you're giving a lot of energy and time when mm-hmm. people ask you for advice? I'm like, yeah. He was like, and they're getting results. Next time somebody asks you uh, for some advice, put a dollar to it. Mm-hmm. And I did. I was nervous, but I did. And sure enough, the person was like, that's it. I said, mm, that's it. You know. But that's what made me realize, okay, there's a gift here. There's something here that God is pushing me to do. And I'm not going to let fear stop me because I didn't think I was the best actor back then. I didn't think, you know, I had the coaching prestige to be able to help another actor. But when I realized, wait a minute, I'm already doing it. There's already results. It just pushed me to go further. I want to commend you because you realize that acting is also a business. Mm -hmm. And you being able to start your studio and give people so many opportunities, learning from you is amazing. I do want to ask you, though. How are you able to get our people to spend money with you? Because you know it's super difficult trying to convince your friends who they you knew all their you know they knew all your life. How were you able to convince our people to spend money with you? Because as we all know, it's very difficult to convince us for something that we've been asking you for free. Now we want to put a dollar on it. Nowadays, it's like the results speak for itself. You know, Absolutely. you see people who are in your own backyard, your own neighborhood on these major network TV shows with major agents. But when I first started, I gave a lot. My prices were like the super lowest price you could ever see for an acting studio. Because I remember when I was in New York, living in New York, you spending three or four hundred dollars a month to do no, an acting I mean. class. You may be able to renew maybe one time, especially if you're a starving artist. So I wanted to make sure the prices were so low that it made you want to come because you can afford it, but keep coming. Because that's the biggest problem why actors are not training. It's not that they don't want to. It's like, can I invest that much money for that amount of time to continue to build my craft? So I think that's how we were able to win so many actors over was, okay, the price is the lowest price. But two, people realized there wasn't that many on-camera acting studios here in this area. Mm-hmm. right? There are a few, but not too many doing what we do. And when I first started the studio, at first we was just another actor studio that was training and teaching the business, but we didn't really understand how much we stood out as an on-camera studio. Absolutely. You know, and once we started putting the marketing on that, started making people realize, no, you come in here to get film, TV, commercial, you're actually learning how to get on camera, that's what really sold the person on, like, I want to come here. But two, we also have a culture of a family-like atmosphere, mm-hmm. you know, because a lot of times you feel competition when you're in class. You feel like, who's the best one in the room? But in this room here, we don't have that. This support, we cheer each other on. 
whether you're the top actor in the classroom or you're just getting started, you realize you have the support and community you need to build here. You know, and then the biggest thing that we had uh, people come here for is our Ready for New York workshops. Mm -hmm. So because of a lot of the relationships I built in New York and even in Atlanta with a lot of agents, managers, casting directors, we were able to get them to come down before the pandemic, come down in person right. and uh, teach these workshops, see these talent, help build those relationships. And when people started seeing that, they were like, wait a minute, this person's not only teaching us how to act, but he's connecting us, he's building that bridge. And that's why you see so many other people right here from PG County mm -hmm. on these major shows because of those relationships. I love that. And do you guys also do virtual as well? Absolutely. Yeah, we're hybrid. So even while we're in person teaching class, you could be taking a class from home and you feel like you're in the class with us and not like just a fly on the wall. Because the way we have our coaches teach, you feel like it's more so interactive virtually than it is in person sometimes. You know, So you're getting the best of both worlds. I just wanted to take a second to stop. Because I hope you guys are listening to Mark right here. He is telling you that his academy offers a one-stop shop. I'm telling you, he can groom you from the top actor to somebody that's just getting started. And these services are not offered. And especially at this amazing price, I want you guys to get into it now. Because me, myself, even as an actress, this is something that I'm looking for. This is something that I need. And I know he's here to help you guys as well. So I hope you guys are paying attention. And at the end, I will definitely put his information in. I also want to transition from Mark the teacher, Mark the friend, Mark the little boy, to now Mark the actor. So I seen you in the waiting room, and you were the lead male actor in there, and you did a phenomenal job. How did you go about auditioning for this, and what was the best experience that you had from it? Wow. Um... First off, I gotta say, working in the waiting room was a treasure because I got to work with the Cheryl Lee Ralph. She yes. was directing it. And I loved working with her because of her affirmations on set. She not only made you feel comfortable, but she made you feel like you were great at what you did. Mm -hmm. You know, so that helped me along the way in the process of getting the character and playing the scene. Um, but yeah, auditioning for it. So uh, me and Tressa Smallwood, we, had a, we have a great relationship. And I remember she gave me a call and said, Mark, like, there's this role in the movie. And she was honest. She's like, we're trying to get a named person for this role. But this happened during COVID. So a right. lot of the options that they wanted to go with, mm -hmm. they weren't available anymore. You know, whether it was something else came up or they, 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 they just kept pushing the dates back. Because she said, I want you to audition for the role. Put yourself on tape. Get it in. And so we sent it in. And sure enough, like, I got that call, you know. And they said, listen, the role is yours. You know, you, you, you get ready. Get ready. You know, so... When I got that news, I was happy because that was my first time uh, being able to uh, work with Mega Mind in mm -hmm. that capacity as an actor. Because I've helped them behind the scenes with, you know, getting active right. on their projects yeah. and whatnot. But to be able to be an actor in their project was a blessing. It built me and Tressa's relationship as well. And now we have an ongoing relationship in this bridge where we're helping so many talent in the DMV area yeah. uh, get work out here. So I will say it's so important to have those relationships because mm -hmm. like you're saying you you didn't mind helping in the background mm -hmm. i know maybe your big part was you wanted to be an actor on camera but you were like you know what i'm okay to work in the background i'm okay to work myself up and it's so important for people to understand mm -hmm. that you might not start on screen right i remember me just being an assistant mm -hmm. working at cb i mean abc in right, new york right. and i was just do, reading the scripts or setting up the lights mm -hmm. and my whole vision was always to be a tv host mm -hmm. but sometimes you got to start small absolutely and it doesn't mean that you're starting small that you won't get big right and you got that opportunity that honestly was a blessing for you because these people weren't able to work during covid but you were getting paid during covid what mm -hmm. a blessing mm -hmm. so many people lost their jobs lost their lives and Look at you. Now you get the opportunity of a lifetime to be on national TV Absolutely. for an amazing film. And then it had a purpose. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to people actually what the movie was about? Yeah, so the movie dealt with breast cancer. Um, they made the movie to play during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so they put a lot of focus on that. You know, so my character played the fiance of someone who had breast cancer. You know, when I engaged her, mm -hmm. I didn't know, we didn't know she had it. And so in the middle of our journey, you know, she finds out she has it. But the love and the heart that my character had for his fiance, he didn't want to give up. Because I've seen stories in real life and in movies with the person like, all right, you about to get out of here. I know. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to get out of here too, you know, but he stayed there and he loved her through it. Still got married to her, still made sure that he made her feel special until her last day. Yeah. You know, um, but one of my, my favorite moments was one of the toughest moments, uh, but was the final scene of that movie. Because I had to pull from a deep emotional place because they, they needed me to be at a deep place when she had passed away. And the funny part about that is, you know, when the first take went on, we did it, the whole entire room was crying. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the room was crying. Mm -hmm. I was like, I did it. I'm good. We got to get closer. closer. Like, oh, okay. Many of you we have learned about Raven's again. health through the video. We shot it again. I thought I got it again the second time. They was like, we love it, but we got to get even closer. You know, she so it was like, that's something that I learned from the spot. Was like, don't give it all on the first take. Save mm -hmm. some of it so they get that close up. But yeah, it, it was a, a truly amazing experience. It taught me a lot about myself. Um, and it helped open a lot of doors for me from that project. Absolutely, and that project's premiere, actually everyone was in the drive-in in their mm -hmm. cars. Mm -hmm. I went to the premiere. And even the emotion with the people in the cars Raven was, was never so scared just to be to raw to and real with on you. The big screens. Thank but you. it just Her shows Raiders. that like, People are here and we're here to persevere. Absolutely. And that's what I got from that movie. Absolutely. And at that time, my mom, she had got diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. She was in the early stages, so thank God wow. she didn't have to go through like chemo and things right. like that. But it really resonated with me because our family just was surrounding her and wow. covering her in that time. Right. So to see your character like that as a man mm -hmm. and be able to tap into those emotions mm -hmm. are big. Yeah, and that's that's another thing that I loved about that movie because I'm really big on purpose and that was another another thing to go towards purpose because so many people after that film came out came to me to share their stories about themselves or their mom or their sister or someone they knew who had it you know so for them to be able to come to me and open up it was to the point where I was like my marketing team was my excuse me my um, PR team was able to get me on to a campaign to do it even more because so many people had stories they wanted to share. Yeah. You know, so it's definitely a powerful thing. I know they do it every year and it's yeah. good to see that the message continues to go and we're using our craft to back in to tell these stories. It definitely is. And that's why I got my pink on today. No, you know, it was breast cancer. It really is. I well, my pink. Yeah, it's I, okay. Memo, right? <laughs> you know, but definitely I wanted to um, just touch on that. And you have a recent movie that just came out, Once Upon a Time in the District, yes. and you played Vince. And yes. I got the pleasure of seeing you at the premiere phenomenal job. I didn't like you though. Good. I, you know I, what I'm that's saying? One of my I didn't like means, you though. Good. If, if anyone <laughs> know me in real life, they know I'm the nicest, bestest person in yes. the world. And so when you say you don't like me, that means oh, I was in my character. I did my thing. I did my work. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, how did you feel about that character? Complete opposite from the waiting room. Yeah, so how was that experience? And uh, I didn't like you at all. <laughs> <laughs> the, thing, the thing is like you know, when I did the role of Vince, well, when I first got offered the role, I was at a time in my life where I was trying to redefine myself, discover myself, because okay. uh, there was a lot of changes in my personal life. There's a lot of things I was going through mentally that was messing with my confidence. Mm. Um, a lot of work slowed down for me in New York um, because I was very heavily involved in church, you know, still am, don't get me wrong, but very heavily involved in church, um, was known as a good guy, the guy that's just going to just be the nice, loving, good guy, right? But the problem was a lot of projects in New York didn't want that. Mm -hmm. They didn't want just a good cop. They want the edgy cop. They want a little bit of sex appeal. They wanted these things. So I had to tap into something deep within myself that was there, but I was hiding. You know, so once I tapped into that, that was around the time when Harold, you know, I was working out in the gym. Right, right, right. And he happened to be there. I didn't even know it was him. Because okay. he had a mask on and a hoodie on. Okay. He came up to me. He was like, what's up, Mark? Didn't you coach uh, Brave Williams on my movie? I was like, yeah. I was here. I was like, coach. He was like, I need your email. I was like, cool. And then he left. Like, that was it. Mm. I was like, cool. And he emailed me the next day. And it was a script. And he was like, let me know what you think about the role of Vince. And when I read that role, I said, this is a start to the direction I'm redefining. You know, I want to go in this direction. This is something that would be good footage to have for my reel to market myself and my team to market me. And so I took it on and I had a great time on that set. I enjoyed that type of character and it opened up another door for me because now that marketing and that movie opened up a door for Mayor of Kingstown. Okay. And I'm going on Paramount where I'm playing a crypt. So I got tied it all up and okay. everything. A little bit more direction in the edge, you know. Yeah. So it's like the things that I've been putting away have started to blossom now because of that redefining moment in my career. I love that. So what other things do you have going on? You're right. So I have a Christmas movie that's getting ready to come out uh, November 8th. Mm -hmm. It's called A Family Matters Christmas. It actually stars uh, Joe Marie and Kelly Cheyenne Williams from Family Matters. Right, yeah. They're in it as well. It already won like two awards and some film festivals, but it's going to be streaming everywhere November 8th. 
Um, so that was a comedy. I had fun with that. Um, so hopefully everybody can check that out. It's streaming everywhere. Like anywhere you can think about streaming, it's going to be on there. So I want to ask you, when you leave here, what do you want your legacy to be? What would you want people to remember you as? I want people to be able to say that Mark McKinnon was not only a man of purpose, but a man that helped people find their purpose. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that because that's what my whole life has been about. Everything that I do has been purpose driven. Everything that I do has been able to like help people see within themselves where they can go with their passion, but also what they can do with their purpose. So as long as you know how you're able to help somebody else, you know, because a lot of times we get so focused on our passion that, yeah, there's some seasons where you got to be selfish, but you can't be selfish for so long that you're never taking the time to help somebody else. You know, so let my journey of being an actor and an acting coach be a testament that like, yes, you can do the things you love, but also help people along the way. And I truly believe that everything that we go through, even our struggles that we overcome, we're going through that to be able to help somebody else. You know, and that goes back to purpose. So that's what I, you know, want to be known as and be left, leave this earth uh, leaving is definitely like purpose. Well, I can guarantee you after people watch this interview, they definitely will feel that from you. And they definitely will go home and reevaluate what their true passions are and what they really want to succeed in life doing. I want to thank you so much okay. for joining me today at the Red Carpet Lounge. You have been phenomenal. So much of what you've said have touched me, and I know it will touch others. If people want to reach you, can you please let them know where they can find you, your social media, and your email? You can follow me on Instagram at the Mark McKinnon. If you want to see the success of some of our clients and learn more about our classes, you can follow us at McKinnon Acting Studio or visit our website, McKinnonActingStudio.com. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you guys again for tuning in to the Jazzy Mango Red Carpet Lounge. You can follow me at J-A-S-Z-Y, Mango Like Your Favorite Fruit Everywhere. And if you like the outfit that I'm wearing today, it's from Jazzy Mango Curvy Fit. You can definitely go and purchase it there. And also check me out on BET Plus Trophy Wow. You jazzy. Wow. You everything a man could ever want. Girl, you jazzy. You know about that drama. You know you been classy. You jazzy. All these other niggas shoot the shot, but you ain't have it.